we'll go to Philippians chapter 3. And I want to read verse number 8 to verse number 12. Verse number 8, it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though it had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would just guide and direct my message this morning. Give me the clarity of mind and the power to bring forth this message that would help us in our daily lives. Thank you, Lord, for the scripture we're about to look into and the power of it and the need that we have it in, for, for it in our lives. I pray each one of us would walk away different today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I started going at this chapter with the idea that all that counts is Christ. All that counts is Christ. Notice in the beginning there how it says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. So basically what it's saying is all that counts is Christ. Nothing else matters. When we looked at verses number 1 to 7 or 1 to 8, it's dealing with salvation. And Paul's explaining what a true believer is like, how that uh, we need, we're, the, we're those that worship in spirit. Uh, we are those that rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh whatsoever. That is a, a sign of being a true believer. When you don't look at yourself and realize, yeah, I've got nothing <laughs> that God can be pleased with. You know, the only thing that God is pleased with is with his son. That's why it says we rejoice in Christ Jesus. So the only thing we can truly rejoice in or even brag about or have glory in is the fact of what Jesus, who he is, and what he did for us. And what his sacrifice on the cross meant for each one of us. Even in this passage, how he goes on to say, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. So he was completely discounting even any part of his own righteousness. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So even to go to heaven, and now a lot of people don't understand this, but you know you've got to be perfect to go to heaven, right? You can't, you can't go to heaven as a sinner. <laughs> now we know we're sinners, so that's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's a problem being a sinner and realizing you can't be a sinner to go to heaven. But that's where the righteousness of Christ comes in. And we talked about that last time. We talked about the imputation, the imputation of, of Christ's righteousness to our account and how that when he went to the cross, he imputed our sinfulness upon himself and then in return imputed his righteousness upon us. So that we're not going to stand before God one day and say, hey, you know, I'm here because I did this and I've got a bunch of eyes there. I did, I did, I did. I went to church and I sang in the choir and I've been a real nice guy and I was used by the church and all is I, I. There is no I. <laughs> in fact, I is the middle letter, letter of pride. <laughs> there is no I. Satan did that too. He says, I will exalt myself. I will be like the most high. That's, that's what you go after when you start bringing I in there for salvation. The righteousness that we need for salvation is not gained by you doing something. <laughs> it's gained by putting your faith and trust in Christ and then having his righteousness imputed to your account so that when you stand before God, what's he going to see? Is he going to see somebody that was really bad and now they're really good? Is that what he sees? No. You know what he sees? He sees somebody 
who has never been bad. He's seen somebody who has never sinned. If you're standing before God in the righteousness and the record of Christ, all God can see, all the Father can see, is a sinless record. Do you understand that? Now, you know you've sinned since you got saved. But do you understand that your record is still sinless before the Father in heaven? But, you know, your sin has caused you problems, hasn't it? It messes up what you call fellowship with God. It messes up your purpose. See, he left you here in a sinful mind and a sinful body. You had no choice about that. <laughs> he, he sealed your spirit. I mean, your spirit is sealed into the day of, day of redemption. We know that you're perfectly sealed and you're going there and your record is secure. But at the same time, you have been left in a corrupt situation where your body is corrupt and your mind is corrupt. So we know that the sin principle has never left you, but it isn't amazing that God still looks at us and his record of his son still qualifies for us? Because God's not looking at halfway through the process here. When God does something, he starts it to finish it. That means the day that you got saved, he saw you in your final state. He saw you in your resurrected body. He saw you in your... In your uh, purged mind and heart your new thinker amen that's what he sees you as that's what he sees you as but he's left us here in this predicament <laughs> you know and i wish i wish i didn't have a corrupt body i wish you know i wouldn't have to have this i wish that you know uh, my mind could be sharp and i could always think on the right things and and say the right things but you know what i don't sometimes i say the wrong things sometimes i do the wrong things and you do too and yet the Lord in this process is still giving us an opportunity to be used by him with an ultimate end of a perfect record with God. The Bible says unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his glory. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about salvation in the first eight verses here. And then he goes on to say in verse number nine, that I may know him. So I'm saved, I'm found in his righteousness, that I may know him. The Lord saved me, gave me eternal life, came into my heart. Why? That I may know him. The reason why the Lord left you down here and the reason why you're saved today is so that the Lord could have a relationship with you and that you could know who he is. Like I told people last week, you know, at salvation, even though you maybe thought you knew a lot, <laughs> but you really didn't know God. When I got saved, the amount I knew about Jesus Christ was that much. <laughs> Just like when you get married. The amount you know about your wife and marriage <laughs> is that much. You know, later on, all of a sudden, no, now I know. you got married that you may know her. You got saved that you may know him. Now this is the key today. Are you knowing him? The first verse after Paul deals with salvation, being found in the righteousness of Christ, he says, that I may know him. See, this is what it's about today. How many of us have neglected that, that, all-consuming purpose of us being left here in our saved state on this earth, but in a state where by faith we can know him through his word, and we've neglected it. We've neglected it. And that's the reason the Lord saved you. Oh, no, he saved me so I could do great things. Let me, let, let, I'm going to let you in on something. You can't do great things if you don't know him. You, you, you won't. You think you are, but you're not. Well, no, I'm left here to be a soul winner. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, all right? You're not going to be a soul winner until you know him. You're not going to be used by God until you know him. And the greater degree that you know Christ and his person is the greater degree that the Lord can use you. 
because the knowledge of Christ is now infiltrating your heart and mind, renewing your thinking, and making you usable. It's so important. I just thought it was so interesting. After he talks about salvation, the next thing was, that I may know him. That I may know him. But notice he, he, he gives us a couple of things here in verse 8. Verse 9, or which one is that? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So there's three things that are mentioned here. So we're supposed to know the person of Christ. We're supposed to know the power of Christ. And we're supposed to know the persecution of Christ. These three things should be a part of your, your Christi Christian experience. And if they are not, then we're not growing. <laughs> then our desires aren't right. So last time we talked about knowing the person. We talked about how that there's no joy unless you know Christ. I want to find happiness. You're not going to find it in your paycheck. I mean, you will as long as the paycheck's there. <laughs> Amen. But after the paycheck's gone, you're going to be just as sad as you were before. And sometimes even sadder because that money got you in a whole lot of trouble. Amen. Joy is something you get, not from a paycheck. Joy is something you get from knowing Christ. Peace. You need peace? How is your heart today? You all frustrated and anxious about things? <laughs> well, the only way you're going to get that is by knowing Christ, his person. Learn of me, he says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Amen. But I want to move on this morning to look at knowing the power of Christ. The power of Christ. This is so vital. This doctrine is so huge. <laughs> when you start looking at the, what he's saying here, that I may know him, the person, and the power of his resurrection. The resurrection doctrine of the scripture is phenomenal. It is huge. It is central. And without it, Number one, you don't have salvation. And number two, you don't have the Christian life. Number three, you're miserable. First Corinthians chapter 15, you read First Corinthians chapter 15, it's called the resurrection chapter. It deals specifically with the resurrection. He says, if, if all we have is hope in Christ, in this life, we are of all men most miserable. That means if there is no resurrection, you're a miserable person. <laughs> Amen. So this resurrection gives us the possibility to have joy that goes beyond this world. And so it's very important that we understand the power of the resurrection. The word power here means to be able or it is uh, to be capable of something. So when he's saying the power of the resurrection, he is saying the ability to raise up something that was dead and make it alive. The ability. Now this is something each one of us here do not have. And no matter who claims it, and folks, there's a lot of crackpots out there that think they've done it, and they have not. Because there's no purpose for it, is to raise somebody from the dead. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, this is a powerful doctrine. The resurrection was made possible due to the real ability of our God to take something that has no life in it and bring life to it. <laughs> that, my friend, is beyond anything you or I could ever do. But that is something God can do. So the Apostle Paul is saying, I want to know your person, but I also want to know what the ability of a God he is that can take something inanimate, no life, and bring life into it. I want to know that power in my life. Now you can ask yourself, why do you want to know that power, Paul? Well, there's reasons for that. See, the power of the resurrection is important. You know, in our declaration of who, even who Jesus Christ is, in Romans chapter 1, it says this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Do you understand today, if, there, if Jesus Christ did not raise up from the grave, you would have absolutely no message to tell anybody. The declaration that we make is that we know the Son of God with power because of the resurrection from the grave. Amen? Without this resurrection, we would not be claiming the Sonship of Christ. We wouldn't be debating whether God, Jesus was God or not. Now, Jesus is God. Not was, is, and will always be. He is God. And what proved it is when he raised himself from the grave. He did it. <laughs> I can't do that. You can't do that. Only God can do that. The power of the resurrection is important to us that are saved. It's not just for when we got saved, but it's important for us after we get saved. See, in Romans 5, verse 9, it says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's a good verse. It's telling me that I've been declared righteous through the shedding of his blood. That is the death. That is the cross. That's what he did when he went to that cross. He, he, he paid for my sin so I could receive the righteousness of God and be saved from wrath through him says, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled. Now that we're reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you get that? So the blood of his son had an important part of our salvation. <laughs> we got saved because he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. He says, and that brought you reconciliation with God. That brought you and God together when before you were separated. Amen. But he says, now, now he says, much more being reconciled. I am reconciled now. He says, now that you're reconciled, you know what the important thing is? Is that you're saved by his life, not his death. See, his death saved me. <laughs> I know I'm going to heaven, folks. I don't have to rehash that. Some people have to s spin that wagon every, every week, it seems. <laughs> they never go further. I'm already reconciled. But now because I'm reconciled, the most important doctrine for me is the fact that he lives. That he is up there right now praying for me. And that he gave me a whole bunch of things that is going to keep me usable for his honor and for his glory. And that's due to his resurrection. See, it's important that we believe in the resurrection. Now, you can't get saved without believing in the resurrection. So I believe he died, but he didn't rise again. <laughs> well, <laughs> what good is a dead God? <laughs> Amen. He's, he, he's where Muhammad is then he'd be where Buddha is. He'd be where all these other guys are. But that's not where Jesus is. He did not stay in the grave. He rose up, and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father on high. Amen. And because of that, it opened up the way for all of us at salvation to be placed into him, to be buried with him, and to be risen with him the very moment that you receive Christ as your Savior. So you are not sitting down here somewhere. Your position is up there. You're seated with him in the heavenlies, Ephesians chapter 2. That's due to the resurrection. <laughs> so now I'm seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Now what do I have available to me? Sitting beside the very Son of God. Being in the Son of God. In Christ being resurrected. See, because he is risen <laughs> and he's at the right hand of the Father. And because I am born again and I'm placed into him. I have everything that's available to the Son at my disposal in my life. It's important. When Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that's what he's talking about. 
And I want to look at this a little bit more as we go through this today. Every believer should know the power of Christ's resurrection. This should be a desire in every one of our hearts. It shouldn't just be for the apostle. It shouldn't just be for the preacher. Every born-again believer here ought to have a desire in their heart to understand and to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's powerful. Christian, do you know that if you are in Christ today, Christ is above all principality and power. He's above all might, and dominion. He's above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And the Bible says that if you're born again, you're actually in him. Not only that, if you're in him, the Bible says that all things are under his feet. Then why are we living like we're under everybody else's feet? You understand what Paul wanted when he said, I want to know the power of the resurrection? <laughs> He says, I want to know how to live the life where I'm positionally seated in Christ and living that position here on earth. Where the things on this earth do not overwhelm me, where I quit, but where I see with great clarity that no matter what I do, no matter where I go, all things that happen to me, that will happen to me, that have happened to me, are all underneath my feet just like they're under Christ's feet. Folks, you know how powerful that could be if we can grab a hold of that truth? <laughs> how many days have we wasted under the circumstances? You know, we gotta stop wasting our time under the circumstances. We gotta get above them. And how to give above them is understanding the power of the resurrection of Christ. So, the power, what does this do for us, this power? How does this practically help us? Well, the first thing I want you to know is the power of Christ shows us that there are no trials or temptations that God cannot conquer. No trials or temptations. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, you know, my life would be so great if it wouldn't be for all these things. Oh, that person and that person and this situation, this money problem, and my goodness, I would just be so happy if it wouldn't be for all of these circumstances. Can I tell you something? The fact that God raised Jesus Christ from the grave and placed us into him in that resurrected state tells us that there are no trials or temptation that have not been conquered by the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. That is a practical application of this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, suffer you, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you understand in a believer's life, there's never a time where you can say, this is too much for me. If you've just said that, you've just believed a lie. 
You've just denied the God that wrote the word of God. <laughs> you denied the one that bought you with his blood. He says there's no temptation taken you, but to such as common to man. And God is faithful. What is the purpose of God being faithful? Because that is all that matters in your problems. It doesn't matter how great you are. <laughs> It just matters how great God is. He is faithful, and he will not suffer you. He will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able, above your ability. So when Job went through the sufferings there, lost his family, lost his riches, lost his health, his wife said, curse God and die, he didn't reach the place where it was too much for him. And I'm going to tell you something. You haven't reached that place either as God's people. Now, the devil may have convinced your head that it's too much. But it's a stinking lie. And because it's a lie, you're under your circumstances. And you don't see the escape hatch. You don't see it. And you won't take it. And the devil is so deceptive and so dangerous that he gets you to believe as a born-again believer that you cannot overcome your trials and temptations and he will keep you there until the day you die where you never truly experience the power of the resurrection of Christ in the trials of your life. It's nobody else's fault. It's because of you. Because you refuse to believe a God that has done everything but tell you, and, and he's, he's done it with truth. He's never lied to you. That's why it says, but God is faithful. He is faithful. Now, don't be uh, interposing all your disappointments in your earthly fathers and your friends and your coworkers and your employers and everybody's let you down and somehow make God like them. He is not. He is faithful. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Practical example of this is the Apostle Paul when he, when he had that thorn in the flesh and he thought that perhaps it'd be better for him not to have it. Many people think it was maybe an eye disease, something like that, that caused him to be, the Bible says his bodily presence was weak, his speech contemptible. So he wasn't a great preacher. He didn't have a great presence in the pulpit and he was kind of gross to look at. So people are thinking that maybe it was an eye disease that causes eyes to pus and to drain all the time. And in Galatians he wrote, look at this large letter that I've written unto you. <laughs> well, the only problem is it's only six small chapters long. It's not very large at all. But I think he was talking literally, look at the large letters, <laughs> you know. And yet when he went to the Lord... And he besought the Lord thrice that the Lord would take that thorn out of his flesh. Dear God, I'd be so much more effective if you just take this away from me. And he did that three times and God just says, no, Paul. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's the power of the resurrection. When you and your, with a broken body, seeking the Lord for healing, he says, no, I'm going to leave you like that. And not only that, with your broken body, you're going to be far more powerful than if you had an able body. My friend, that's the power of the resurrection. So when the Apostle Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, this isn't some glorious power that's going to make you like this huge soldier. It just may break your body. Maybe for you to know the power of the resurrection, you may have to lose some things so that his strength can be made perfect in your weakness. Many times our, our, our strength takes the place of God's strength. So he has to take away our strength so that his strength can be seen. That is the power of the resurrection. Number two, 
the power that raised Christ shows us that God can give us the power to have and to live a new life. A new life. Folks, I don't believe it when you tell me, well, I just can't do right. I've received Christ, but I just can't live that Christian life. You're listening to a dirty, rotten, stinking lie. The power of the resurrection is given to you so you can live a new life. The Bible says in Romans 6 verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. So that means when you got saved, you were spiritually placed into Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. At that moment when all of the punishment of sin was placed upon Christ, your sin was dealt with in that lot. Amen? You were placed into his death. Otherwise, you'd have to find another way to get to pay off that debt. The reason why his death paid for your sin is because your sin was in the pile. When you got saved, the Father counted you to be placed into Christ. The word baptism means to be placed into, or to be fully overwhelmed. This is not talking about being baptized by water. When you get baptized by water, you don't get baptized into death. Unless I hold you underneath there for a while. Amen? We don't do that around here. It gets you into trouble. You get placed into his death literally. Where the Father looks at Christ's death, and now that death counts for your death. For the wages of sin is death. So I were to ask you, when did your sin get paid for? How did your sin get dealt with? Well, my sin was in Christ 2,000 years ago. It was on him. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen? It goes on to say that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's why when I baptize somebody, the baptism is simply a picture it's a testimony. It's a, it's a message that you're sending to the church. Well, I always say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. When you've made a decision to give a picture of what Christ did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago in that water, you are telling these people, guess what? I'm living a new life now. I don't want my old life. I'm done with it. I want to follow Christ. I'm identifying with him today. I'm no longer ashamed. Amen. You get out of that tank. You start living like the devil. You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. I'd be a hypocrite. This is a picture of how that 2,000 years ago your sin was placed into Christ. This is a picture of how that 2,000 years ago Christ raised up from the grave and now that you believe on him, you are now living a new life in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So why isn't that the case? That's why Jesus, when he was water, baptized in water, <laughs> walked 60 miles to be baptized by John in the place called Beth Bara, which is called the place of crossing. That place of crossing is where Israel, thousands of years before, went across the Jordan as a picture of their surrender to a faith life. After wandering for 40 years, living in the flesh. The place of crossing. That's why when I talk to somebody about being baptized, this is the place of crossing. I mean, this isn't where you get saved. But in the mind of the people 
They're looking at you and you're making a statement saying, guess what? I'm living a new life. And if you're not wanting to live a new life, then don't do it. Then keep living your life the way it is. Do you understand that? It's a mockery. I'm not saying you lost your salvation and you can't. <laughs> I'm saying maybe you weren't saved in the first place. You know how many people have had to baptize again because they weren't saved after they got baptized? They, they, they weren't saved before they got baptized and then they got saved afterwards. What did I do? Did I just count that first baptism for the No. Say, so guess what? Sal baptism is always after salvation. You're going back to make another statement. Amen. It's important. In Colossians 2, verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Walk is practical. One foot in front of the other. Your life is supposed to be a practical example of following Christ. Amen. 1 John 2, 6 he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. When you trust in the power of the resurrection of Christ, you believe that your sins have been forgiven. Folks, when I first started going to church, I was in a rock band. We were touring around. I'll tell you something, I had a whole different group of friends. You wouldn't know that person today because I'm, no, I'm not anywhere like him <laughs> do you understand that in fact after I got saved it was like my eyes opened up and I just saw I, I just saw everything <laughs> I saw the error in who I was and what I did and I understood that what I needed to become and I knew there was a long way to go but I understood that, that something had changed in me <laughs> And the Lord began to work in my heart. It didn't take long, and nobody told me to cut my hair, but also I just felt the Lord wanted me to cut my hair to look appropriate. Because the Bible says it's not a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, you wouldn't know that by most pastors today, they got long hair just like that. <laughs> and like I said, Jesus didn't have long hair, folks. Put away the family Bibles. Those pictures aren't a, a real photograph. <laughs> Amen. So he didn't have long hair. So there's things that the Lord does in your heart and he changes you. You've got a new life. And that's the power of the resurrection. He's because you've been raised from the dead. He took something that was dead and he put life into it. When I was lost, I had nothing. I had no life. But in the moment I turned to him, he put his life in me. He took something that was dead, inanimate, useless, profitless, and he put his precious life inside of me. And it made me new. And it didn't take long. I started desiring the Bible. <laughs> I'd never read through a book of the Bible. I said, I'm going to take a Bible college class, and I took the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is only six chapters. And I remember the requirements were, you got to read through Ephesians four times. I was just... We're talking a semester here. You guys have read a lot more of that in my last class. <laughs> Amen. How overwhelmed I was that I had to read Ephesians four times. <laughs> Man, I was starting at the, I was at the gate. I was at the gate of the race. But there's always a gate. You just got to keep going. You got to hit that next, next marker. You got to make it around that next bend. You've not arrived. But I'll tell you something you have a new life. And that's something you know. If you know the power of the resurrection, you know that your life is different. Your life has changed. I wonder if I'd have testimonies today how many would say, you know, preacher, let me tell you how my life has changed. It'd be powerful. Maybe tonight we'll do that. My third point will be done. The power to raise Christ from the dead proves that God has the power 
to raise men from the grave. I hope you're not doubting that there is a resurrection day. There is a day where this body is going to be made like unto Christ's glorious body. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20, it says this, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He is able. The power of the resurrection, the ability to raise us is in Christ. Vile body. This is referring to the sinfulness and the character of our body. Hey, I understand you want to go to the gym every day and you want to look in the mirror and you'll flex your muscles and stuff. Do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you something. That body you see in the mirror there, it's very temporal. Very temporal. And not only that, all of a sudden later on, stuff like this starts to happen. Your knees start to give out. Your body becomes weak. Maybe you can't breathe like you could before. Maybe your heart is damaged. Maybe there's some other issue. Maybe even in your mind, your mind isn't as clear as it used to be. Can I tell you something? What, a, what an encouragement it is to know that this vile body is going to be changed. And you're going to be thinking as sharp as a tack. The Bible says you're going to run and not be weary. You're going to walk and not faint. I never used to, it never used to be a thought to me, you know, going for a walk and thinking about fainting. <laughs> you know, these days I'm saying, <laughs> okay, what's going to happen here? Bad knee. It seems you got, a, uh, you got an injury or something to go the same distance takes three times more out of you than it did before. Then it starts to dawn on you, walk and not faint. Run and not be weary. You guys should come out door, doing door hangers with us. You get some of these young guys, they're like nine, 10 years old and they're out. I mean, we have races. We say, hey, you start on that side, we'll see who gets it done first. And they're just sweating and panting. I'm looking at them, man, I wish I could do that, <laughs> you know. You know, there'll be a day they'll have that race, not one drop of sweat. No panting. No weariness. That's the promise we have when you receive Christ as your Savior. What day was that? Do you remember? Do you remember there was a specific point in time where you became born again? Do you know that to be true? Well, preacher, I had an experience. Experiences don't save people. Christ saves people. If you didn't, didn't meet Christ there, you didn't get saved. Well, somebody told me to pray this prayer. <laughs> A prayer isn't going to save you. Christ saves you. You put your faith and trust in Christ, not in a prayer. I've had people say, well, you know, uh, if you don't keep believing, then you're going to lose your salvation. <laughs> you don't put your faith in your faith. Everything you have is tainted, including your faith. If you think that you can produce faith to keep you saved the rest of your life, you are mistaken. I always tell people, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. <laughs> that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm saved by grace through faith. What do you go through? <laughs> I go through tunnels. Tunnels bring you through things. Faith is a tunnel. When you received Christ, you went through the tunnel of faith. Well, where did you find salvation in the tunnel? No, your tunnel didn't save you. <laughs> but you had to go through the tunnel to get to your salvation. So what saved you? What was on the other side of the tunnel? 
What was there? Your church? Jesus Christ. See, you didn't get saved through your, by your faith. Your faith did not save you. You're saved through your faith. Jesus Christ is your salvation. So let's say the day after I got saved, something, I got hit by something in this world and my world went for a tailspin. I begin to doubt. Oh, did I really mean it? <laughs> I'll tell you what didn't change. If you found salvation in Christ, you found salvation in Christ. If your tunnel collapsed, you still found Christ. See, today we live in a world, and this is how I grew up. They kept telling me that if you don't continue on in your faith, then you'll lose your salvation. In essence, they're saying you need to trust in your own faith. Once again, it's pointing towards me. And any time you put your faith in yourself, you will be let down. Faith was designed to be extrospective, folks. Faith can never be turned inward. And if there's a religion or a teaching that's causing you to turn your faith inward, they are absolutely wrong. <laughs> there's only one connection to faith, and that is Christ. Christ always has to, or faith always has to be pointed to him. Outward. You get that. You know when you start doubting your salvation? When you take that faith that's supposed to be pointing it outward, and someone deceived you to point it inward. <laughs> Oh, did I pray hard enough? Did I do this? Did I believe enough? Did I, did I, did I, you know? And now your faith is back at yourself again. That's where you lose your, your confidence. That's why in Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 3, it says, we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. None. You get that. Every time I've had somebody in my office doubting their salvation. Now, the first thing I do is talk to them about whether they have been saved. Because <laughs> sometimes they haven't. Sometimes they've never trusted in Christ as their Savior. But I ask them, let's say you were saved. What would get you saved? <laughs> and they would tell me. They would tell me the message that I would tell them. They'd say, well, I believe that Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, came and died for my sins, paid for my sins. He rose up from the grave, and now all we have to do is believe on him, and we are saved. I said, that's a pretty good message. I said, do you believe that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I could see why God wouldn't let you into heaven. You understand that? Why would God kick you out of heaven for giving him the very message that he gave to you? Well, you don't understand. I don't know when it took place. Hold on here. If today you were to tell me that I believe that Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, came and died for my sins and he paid for it all, he rose up from the grave victoriously, uh, showing that he's the perfect Son of God, declared to be the Son of God with power. Amen. And you don't know when you got saved. One thing you can basically mark down is this. You're saved. If you've got a present faith that Jesus Christ did this for you, all I know is it started somewhere. Do you understand that? See, you know what the devil sometimes he does? He tries to get you so focused on when it started that you begin to doubt the message itself. You understand what I'm saying here? <laughs> I don't know the date. I don't know the time. <laughs> Very few people do, especially within the Mennonite world. Because you're never taught you can really know. So you never hold on to a date. So all that does is keep you just guessing, did I really? <laughs> Folks, if you believe today that Jesus Christ died for your sins, paid for them 100% in full, <laughs> he rose up victoriously from the grave, and you have trusted that with all of your heart, you know that's all you need to do to be saved. What else do you need to do? Well, you need to really believe it. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> really, really. <laughs> real is real. Is it real or not? Amen. 
What I'm trying to do is take away the doubt from some people that maybe you don't know when it began. Folks, if you've got a present faith that tells you that Jesus Christ is sufficient, all you know is that that faith began somewhere. All you need to know now is that you have it. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Now, it may just be that, well, I've always kind of thought that I had to do my part. I always thought that maybe baptism would help me. Doesn't hurt. I heard that many times. Well, it doesn't hurt to be baptized. Ha, ha, ha. I says, yes, it does. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> if you're trusting in your baptism, it hurts you a lot. So you don't add things just to make sure. <laughs> Amen. You actually take away things to make sure. <laughs> You're trusting only in Christ. So do you know right now for sure that you are just simply trusting, not church, forget you've ever gone to church, forget you've ever learned anything from any preacher, other than the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for you, paid for your sin, was buried and rose again. Have you put your faith in that? If you have, then you can know him. Do you know him? Do you know his person? And do you know the power of his resurrection? Well, you're going to know that. The proof of that's going to be on how you handle your problems. Do you run away from God? So he's got a problem. I'm out of church. <laughs> Jesus died, rose again, shed his blood, purchased the church with his blood, and that's the one thing you walk away from? You really don't know the power of the resurrection. This is God's plan for you. It's what God wants for your life. It's not just an organization like soccer club. We're not just getting together like, like our book club and discuss the latest thing. This is something that God has implemented for your soul so he could help you to get to that next part in your Christian life. You need this. That's part of the power of the resurrection in your life. Well, I don't need the church. Well, you don't know him. You don't know him nor the power of the resurrection. <laughs> and that's why you'll never also experience the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the last one. How many Christians really suffer for Jesus' sake? Now, we suffer, <laughs> but most of it's because of us, not because of Jesus. See, that is the sign that you know him, is when you suffer for him. Let's bow our heads. Our first question would be, do you know that you're saved? Being born in a Christian family doesn't save you. Going to church doesn't save you. Being happy all the time doesn't save you. Getting baptized in water doesn't save you. Being a church member doesn't save you. Playing piano in the church doesn't save you. Singing in the choir doesn't save you. Nor is it even an evidence that you are saved. What saves you is when you came to a realization of your deep sinfulness and you turned to Christ because you knew he was your answer and you knew there was a debt to be paid which meant either you go to hell forever or I turn to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you put your faith completely in him.